dedicated to Henry Farman. In the years of the primal war, from the war of Terrestrial birth, man mastered the mammoth and horse. Good afternoon, good evening, good whatever, good whomever, good exactly, etc. All of those kind of things. The hostess with the leastest. I'm Alan Averill. This is Agitators Anonymous. It is episode 93. Greetings and salutations, children of technology. Greetings from the capital. The freedom capital of the West. Yes, indeed. Dublin in the Republic of of Ireland. Yes, indeed. How did that happen? Well, if you don't know how that happened, I would catch up on the last few podcasts. We are still in season one at the moment until the big guns in Europe lay down their arms and skulk off into the dark woods they came from. Anyway, so the show is sponsored by MetalBlade.com in North America. Use the promo code AA Podcast, and you will get 10% off your order, free shipping, one or the other, or Eisenwald Records, www.eisenton.de in Europe and .com, the .com in North America, and the same situation applies. So let's get on with it. Episode 93, keep on rocking in the free world, or rather, should that be keep on conforming in the free world. Yes, indeed. Low-hanging fruit. See what I just did there? Well, my apologies once again to the bloody Countess, to Countess Bathory, who has long been overdue a podcast of her own. Um, But I will get to her. I will get to her and I will get to a few other things. Over my YouTube channel, there's been some activity Um, A lot of people are quite enjoying these random, uh, nerdy rock and roll chats I've been hanging with, having with, um, well, and hanging with my good buddy, Addy from Solstafir. Um, They're just up there. We'll just call them the Great Debates. And then, of course, there's my Metal Salvage chats, which me um, and Joe from Gamma Bomb, from uh, that Gamma Bomb up in the northern bit of this island, that also is explained on a previous podcast, and I should say that this is 50 years since Bloody Sunday and all that. Not necessarily correlating those two things with our Joe, but there you go. There you go. Head over to the YouTube channel, just put in Alan Averill, and you will find all sorts of nonsense, as well, of course, as the podcast podcast itself. Now, I understand that the podcast, the nature of the podcast, means that Um, you know, it's not exactly perfect for YouTube, and I understand that there is, well, I don't understand. I'm it's pretty self-evident that there's some kind of pressure to become a TV presenter, that I should start to go um, visual with my podcast. But I'm not quite ready to do that yet. It's a, it's a commitment that my uh, stylist isn't quite up to yet. Uh, anyway, et cetera, et cetera. So like I said, apologies, apologies to the Countess Bathory. But there have been many other things that have been happening again this week. And... I presume that I'm going to be um, the last in a long line of people addressing the whole Joe Rogan uh, controversy lately. And I'm sure some of you are sick of hearing it, but I know the name is pretty big in the circles that we all move in, whether you love or hate the guy. But I'm going to try and dig into that a little bit and try and look at it from a slightly different perspective. Well, at least try. Um, So... There are things, like I said, which are relatively close to that scene, if you know what I mean, that uh, maybe they're a little bit too close to ignore. So here on Agitators Anonymous, I've set out my stall um, as supporting free speech, supporting rational, skeptical thought over emotionally driven faith based narratives. That's been my modus operandi from episode one. And in my own small way, my own small drop in the ocean. Um, This is what I've been trying to do. By the way, if you would like to review or give me a good review over on your uh, podcast provider, that would be great. Or feel free to share the podcast with someone you know who may love or indeed may hate it. I will be um, available for both of those parties Um, and all parties from now on in, seeing as restrictions have been lifted here in the... uh, the United States of Ireland 
Um, every evening feels like a party. Well, anyway, what am I talking about? Right, in my own small way, my own small drop in the ocean, but here we are. I guess we have to discuss the Spotify, Joe Rogan, Neil Young, um, and others, and a growing number of others, sort of war that's going on. Um, I'll start by prefacing this by telling you something silly. Um, I actually got turned on to Joe Rogan years and years ago, maybe even in the late, let's say, 2006, 7, 8, maybe, um, by the guys from Marduk. And it was because I think Daniel had quite an interest in the MMA and he just, you know, would would play various podcasts um, on the tour bus, that kind of thing. It wasn't really of interest to me. I didn't really understand. It's only in the last couple of years that I've begun to understand even, you know, understanding Spotify numbers, even on trying to understand the algorithm. And I can't say it's been for my better health, but I've nonetheless, because of the nature of my work, tried to understand a little bit more. But let us say that before I understood, in my innocence, I said to the people at Metal Blade, I can't remember which primordial album it was. It might have been something 10 years ago. I said, oh, how difficult is it to get on the Joe Rogan show? Could anyone organize that? Yes, indeed. Well, if... Ten years ago, I had gone on the Joe Rogan show. I certainly wouldn't be here doing this now in my front room. I would have an uh, an illustrious and glittering media career. Um, Well, or probably would have been cancelled one or the other. But anyway, there you go. In my innocence, I said to the people, oh, can you get me on the Joe Rogan show? Yeah. Firstly, let's just say that it makes sense. I'm going to try and, um, you know, dissect over this whole row at the moment, Um, you know, uh, makes sense when you look at the ratings of mainstream media um, that they're doing all they can to bring Rogan down. Like, it really kind of sadly makes sense. Um, whether you like or dislike him, and I will get into that, um, I would ask you to keep those um, feelings, those emotional um, maybe attachments to various things just on the shelf for a minute. Let's just look at it in stark, um, non-specific or non-personal terms, i.e., um, take the personal out of the political in this sense, because I often think that the personal is political is a kind of ridiculous concept that often can cloud our view of some of these things in the greater, in the, you know, in the greater perspective or, you know, the macro as opposed to the micro, um, shall we say. So whether you like him or dislike him, and I will get into that, the fact that he's not beholden to the old legacy media, to CNN or Fox or whoever else, um, Rupert Murdoch, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and his reach now dwarfs all of their shows. Um, I think an awful lot of those late night shows, according to the numbers in the USA, are barely getting out of a couple of hundred thousand figures now. I mean, CNN has literally their audience has been cleaved um, completely, while Rogan's has grown. So, of course, the backdrop of all of this is, you know which one must understand all the things moving behind the curtain, whatever you want to say, if you want to pull that back and look at the machine, the old rusted machine of legacy media, it is attempting to bring down, bring down the big game. And that big game is Joe Rogan. So whether, you you know, whatever you personal thing you feel about something, maybe he said, or that you've assumed he said, which is more often than not the case, this is the backdrop of what's happening. Old media, old legacy, Old systems and institutions of power and governance are trying to rein in the the reach of a Joe Rogan. That's the backdrop, whether anyone likes to admit it or not. Um, it's clear that they are now trying to maneuver that old rusty harpoon gun to bring the um, mammoth whale, the, um, I don't know, the Moby Dick of Joe Rogan to bear. I'll leave that pun sitting for your imagination. Um, So like I said, first things first, consider the agenda behind how you emotively feel towards the news. The mainstream media clearly wants rid of him. He's too male, too white and too powerful to be put in very simple, blunt terms. And also he's just not under their control. Those may may be the smokescreen, um, the smokescreen agenda that fits into the modern cultural narrative. But the greater thing behind that is really that he's just not um, in their pocket. So now you are seeing the attempt to, well, to place him there. So whether it's through um, modern woke politics, where they attempt to smear him as a various ism or an ist, or through the rather vague term disinformation, which to me sounds terribly Orwellian, they're going to do all they can to silence him. So remember that in terms of what's happening, and let's actually take a look at what's happening. Um, 
yet he's simply too big. Or is he? There's too much money involved. An anchors of shows that bring in a few hundred thousand viewers at best trying to snag his audience of 10 plus million. And you can see those numbers clearly. And let's be clear, um, as someone who watches Rogan and who has done for years, what makes him so relatable is his curiosity, his non-partisanship to a political party, his willingness to ask questions that make a fool of him or would have compromised presenters bending over backwards to double down on and admit. The fact that he admits it is kind of his strength. And these long form chats, which no one thought would ever work, um, are something that the mainstream media could never really commit to. Now, if you're still in the dark here and don't know what I'm talking about, I suppose I should have started this off the top of the podcast. But it's really that at the moment, people like Neil Young um, and other artists are going after um, Rogan for what they claim is COVID misinformation. That's the backdrop of the story. So you have to ask yourself, we can clearly see that a lot of voices have been censored by tech during, for example, lockdown, people who opposed it. Um, we know the, you know, it's no real secret, I suppose, that the Gates Foundation gave 320 million or so to various news organizations, um, whether it was the B Declaration, which was deplatformed and smeared among many others. Um, and all of the people who talk um, to Rogan um, and who talk to Rogan. And this is what they are kind of coming for. The people that they are, the mainstream media is, um, I suppose, painting with this rather surreptitious brush or this rather vague brush of misinformation. The framing, the framing, as I said, for me is kind of simple. Those disobeying the narrative are framed as spreading disinformation. And that's all that the argument really is. Don't get me wrong, though. I often disagree with points that Joe Rogan makes. Um, I don't think it's a stretch to say that he's been doing a sterling job in providing a platform for people recognized in their field by their peers who have been um, censored by others who have no other place to go, so to say. Who else is there really to stand up to the mainstream dominant? Well, it's not really dominant anymore, I suppose, if you look at the figures, but the mainstream narrative. I don't think it's too far a stretch to say that if we emerge from restrictions and lockdowns, which I, you know, as you know, if you've listened to the podcast, have opposed since day one, with some semblance of our liberty and freedoms uh, intact, even though even though I doubt that is really that possible as they have taken some massive body blows. But if we do emerge from the fog, um, then it will be in some small part due to people like Joe Rogan, um, who allowed people opposing the mainstream narrative to have some form of a platform, but also other non-compromised journalists and media heads who tried to hold conversations in the middle ground or with people the narrative disagrees with. So, for example, drinking a pint in a bar this evening in Dublin without showing a digital pass, honestly, I would say, and it may be a stretch that some of you disagree with, but some small percentage of that, just that simple action, this is owed to people like Joe Rogan. Um, and I don't think and I don't think if you really analyze that statement, it's that controversial. Now, it's maybe, a, a you know, a, the dots are quite far for some people to connect. And I'm not for a moment saying it's only owed to that. But there is a small amount of um, debt, I, in a sense, we owe uh, to the to the crumbling of the narrative to maybe a few slices taken off that wet cake, that wet brain cake that is slowly dissipating. Um, that is owed to people who have stood up against the mainstream narrative. And one of those is, whether anybody likes it or not, Joe Rogan. The last podcast I did was called The Crumbling Narrative. And one of the manic crumblers, we could say, is Mr. Rogan. So let's dig, dig down into exactly what are the claims, other than that I see um, what I see above, above what I've just said previous to this as the undeniable agenda. So first things first, as I laid out in a vaguely, in the vaguely controversial tagline, raging for the machine. Uh, Neil Young, what the fuck happened to Neil Young? Um, really, excuse my language, but he, for example, once upon a time stood on the outside of the tent, pissing in, as opposed to standing on the inside of the tent, pissing out on the rest of us. And that tent, let's be clear, is institutions of state power and governance. And once upon a time, he did try to hold power to account. He once upon a time, you know, to use the phrase off the top of this, raged against the machine and is now raging for the machine. 
um, in a sort of angry, angry, grumpy, septuagenarian, septuagenarian way. Um, how can this hypocris- hypocrisy not be evident to someone like him? A few years ago, he made an anti-Monsanto um, album all about genetically modified um, crops and that kind of thing, GMO, etc. Not an album I know or really a cause I know a hell of a lot about. Um, but what it does signify is that when it suits him, he has a global conscience and stands up to the interests of some of the same people he seems to be now standing for and with. But it seems now he is carrying water for big pharma and tech and government in starting the ball rolling against Rogan, which, let's be clear, if enough musicians started getting involved, like big ones, um, I don't know, a, a Drake or a Rihanna or whoever, um, all you crazy young kids like, and maybe it might do something. Musicians working actively for censorship, uh, working to control the narrative, working to control your decisions and the things that you choose to see or hear. Disgrace and shame, Mr. Young. If you have started that ball rolling, then that is indeed very sad. But let's dig a little bit deeper. Neil Young sold his back catalogue or part of it a few years ago for $150 million. So those of you who are sticking up for him, you are supporting the right of a 70-something multi-millionaire to affect what opinions you choose to hear or see. Does that sound familiar? Because it is. And I can think of the elephant in the room, the tea, the tea man, um, who many people would have, you know, of course, used as an example that we should not listen to um, 70-something white male millionaires setting the agenda for us. Yeah, and you would have been right then as well. And so here we are. But if we dig a bit deeper, if we dig a little bit deeper, and of course the suggestion, what I'm trying to suggest there is that $150 million really does separate him from your interests and my interests and his own. Um, Really, it's um, we don't live in the same world. Also, there's something you might want to consider. The investment company who bought Young's, um, who allegedly bought Young's bag catalog for $150 million. Hip- Hypnosis is partially owned, it would seem, by BlackRock. Now, if you've been following various YouTubers, um, various people in the media, you would have heard that name before. And you might know them as the property investment firm, supposedly profiting from the pandemic by buying up houses. Um, by buying up houses all across the Western world. Um, You will have heard their name in relation to the Great Reset. You will own nothing. Of course, this is about property. And, well, it would seem that the hierarchy within that system shares members of the board with Pfizer. So, connect some dots. Is this the reason for the anti-Rogan rebellion? Um, Seeds of doubt funded by Big Pharma via BlackRock, via Neil Young who they have, let's call it, some form of systematic control over his music uh, and a coordinated effort to take down Rogan, who is platforming people who are opposed to the mainstream narrative. Now, if those bunch of dots there break your brain, no problem. Welcome to the Brain Breaking um, Club. Welcome to the, I don't know, the Teenage Lobotomy Club, whatever you want to call it. Well, hardly Teenage Lobotomy, it would be middle Age Lobotomy. And some would say I had one already before all of this shenanigans started but connect those dots for a moment if you will that the people controlling i mean neil young's um initial um statement i'm gonna take my music down spotify he doesn't own his music to take down off spotify to begin with so this was a ridiculous claim but the people who do own his music if you connect the dots between oh i mean in as much as i can see um connect those dots between all of those people you will find people who have a very clear reason to stop the um to stop rogan platforming people who disagree with the big pharma narrative speaking of big pharma if anyone has seen not seen dope sick i would recommend that to them the whole thing reeks of entitlement it reeks of privilege millionaires privilege and also something a little bit of the conspiracy but also neil young has had spats and arguments with spotify before in fact He's well known within the music industry for basically being a cantankerous old grump who consistently has spats with one 
um, industry and then another attempting he attempted to start his own streaming service years ago charging as I can see $30 a month for access to his back catalogue um, so there's an element of Mr. Young trying to get back at an old girlfriend here um, who got one over on him before there's no doubt it has the vibe of that a vindictive grumpy old millionaire as I said who certainly doesn't have your or my best interests at heart and what's the accusation what is the accusation? Misinformation. Misinformation. Um, or all very, all very Orwellian, if you ask me. The idea of misinformation. What does that actually mean? No specific sentences. No specific points. For example, no, nothing like, say, on episode 1008, um, at 11 minutes and 45 seconds, um, Genghis Khan... Uh, the esteemed Mr. Khan, who you're interviewing, says this, that and the other, which is clearly untrue. And here is the proof. Nothing of the sort, just the vague claim of misinformation. As decided on by who? By Neil Young? Despite the fact that the episodes in question are with doctors and physicians who are published and peer-reviewed in their fields by their peers, who I would wager know a hell of a lot more than, for example, Neil Young knows seemingly about anything really anymore. Certainly... They would appear to know more about um, epidemiology or, um, you know, well, uh, the science. Um, other than that, it would seem they maybe don't know as much about trying to make as much money from their back catalogue as is humanly possible. $150 million, don't forget. And I say this because I know a couple of people who cancelled their Spotify um, membership in... Um, solidarity with Neil Young. Well, I think you really need to think about that decision. In solidarity with Neil Young or in solidarity with the multinational, transnational um, financial investment conglomeration that owns his back catalogue. By the back catalog. And you could have found that out in um, a couple of seconds. Difficult to say. Transnational, multinational, etc., etc. Um, and yeah, and so it all has the kind of feeling of old man shouts at clouds. It's just unfortunate the people standing behind the old man have a little bit more power than that. And if the ball gets rolling, if the ball gets rolling and all of a sudden there is a big move, a rush towards the door, then this could have very serious implications. And, you know, as for Joni Mitchell, well, I mean, look, my mother loved Joni Mitchell and I have a soft spot for some of some songs, um, even though I have, don't think I've heard them in about 35 years. And I underst have the understanding she was quite ill a few years ago, but really advocating censorship, standing on the wrong side of the fence there, Mrs. Mitchell. Now, in their defense, they would say, well, it's to censorship in defense of the public good. Um, I don't think they would use the word censorship. They would go, they would say that the stakes are too high, that the claims are that Rogan is, you know, somehow responsible for, um, well, deaths, etc. And the claim, of course, is, um, you know, fatuous on those terms, but they are, they are saying that this is for the public good. But then again, and who says that? Well, the powers that be, that's who they define what the public good is. So they're advocating for People like um, Niels Lofgren, Joni Mitchell and Young, Neil Young, what they're basically essentially saying to me is they're advocating for state tech, pharma and legacy media to literally have control and power over the narrative, complete control and power over the narrative and um, to completely control it for what they define as the public good. Now, tell me, when did that ever go wrong when we placed um, more power we centralized and conglomerated more power in the hands of the powerful. When did that ever go wrong? But I suppose if you're a rich old millionaire, this kind of thing doesn't really bother you. Mr. Young, I thought maybe it would be more responsible for you to try and campaign for um, other musicians to be paid properly. I have no love for Spotify, but maybe your energy would have been better spent going into that. I certainly would have appreciated it more. Anyway, and for the record, my favourite Neil Young album is the soundtrack to the movie Dead Man. This I would recommend. Um, I'm not really that interested in the rest of it. Some things, okay, after the gold rush, etc. No problem. But the soundtrack for Dead Man is something special. Anyway, well, I don't know about you, but I certainly don't want them, um, and I mean that in the King Diamond sense, um, acquiring more power and control. And certainly bringing down Rogan would be a huge step for them in that direction. 
Um, I want Rogan to continue having the freedom to talk to who he wants and it to be my decision to view it if I so wish. Um, since when did the so-called liberal left decide to advocate for censorship? I mean, it's clear to me that one of the things that has defined lockdown is a clear division in society between those who support collectivism um, over individual liberty, or I would say collective authoritarianism for the public good over individual liberty and freedom. I know which side of the argument I come down on, and I always did, even before any of this began. And I certainly think maybe most of you, judging by the messages I get in relation to the podcast, but even if you hate him, for whatever reason, you have more in common, I think, with Joe Rogan than Neil Young. With the exception of a, you know, a couple of hundred million dollars, of course. It may sound counter counterintuitive speaking to someone who has millions of streams on Spotify from music I wrote, tens of millions actually, um, who never made a penny ever from any of it, um, or at least nothing of note, certainly not even enough by monthly to buy me a rather expensive and inflated drink around the corner um, in these post-lockdown price climates. But anyway, um, Spotify being so huge is what insulates them in this circumstance. And it, pla it paints the move from YouTube to Spotify um, in an even, I suppose, uh, starker light. The move that Rogan um, underwent moving. Uh, everyone said at the time, oh, you're, you're losing X amount of your audience on Spotify, etc., etc. But in, in the end, it worked out. And think about it now. If he was just on YouTube as he was before, I think they would have found it much more easy to cancel or to... Um, silence some of those episodes to shadow ban them etc 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 now as i said young maybe should have put his power and influence to better use how about working to make sure regular musicians who aren't in the position to sell their back catalog for 150 million dollars might make something equitable how about putting your shoulder into that one neil instead of advocating for censorship censorship my friends is the cornerstone of tyranny plain and simple um and it fascinates me that all the people who years ago would have railed against a Rupert Murdoch and conglomerated media ownership now want to or wish to bring down an independent, fundamentally broadcaster, a self-made everyman, and I'm being rather genuous there, to hand over more power to the same old establishment. Can't you see the contradiction inherent in that? Yeah, but he's a misogynist, a mate says. I said, really? OK, well, which episode or any particular comment or... And then... A kind of, uh, well, you know, the woman in sport thing, I say. Well, what do you mean? I think he's actually supporting women in this argument, wouldn't you say or think? Now, there's a reason I don't tread into those gender waters, as I really feel it's not essentially my debate. But when I push people um, to tell me, like, uh, why, like, exactly why they find Ro Rogan objectionable, they usually can't really define it. Oh, he's a, you know, he's an indulged... Um, privileged white male, you know, um, heard it in terms of he's part of the patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera. And I would say, well, what, you know, what does that mean? He started the podcast from nothing before they got popular and it's decades ago and put in thousands of episodes for it got big. Um, of, of, uh, if he's an example of anything, it's um, of building something from the ground up, which I don't really think is a, an example of the system of patriarchy which I would have thought by definition is a structure of inheritance. So building something, um, you know, my, you might disagree with that. And that's really just something I'm thinking about as I'm free forming here, as I'm just talking. But building a podcast from the ground up is really what um, he did. And um, that's really kind of what there is to say about it. And people, and if people want to listen to it, they do. And if they don't, they don't, you know. Um, I've heard all sorts of arguments, but when I've kind of pushed people and gone, OK, well, tell me which particular. Oh, he talked to Candace Owens, he talked to whatever. And I go, yeah, he also talked to, talked to Bernie Sanders. And, you know, I, for every one person I, you could pick out and go, oh, he talked to them, Gavin McInnes or something. I can go, well, you know, he also talked to Sandra Gupta or whoever else from the other side. Um, I find almost all the arguments I've heard from people against him sort of vague and unfocused, mostly hearsay or things they assume or decide upon without ever confirming it. Confirmation bias, I guess. They call it, he's on the old right. Is he? Arguably, his biggest interview of all time was with Bernie Sanders. It practically broke the internet. Um, and, you know, it illuminated Bernie Sanders in an incredibly human way. I watched it and I came away from that going, wow, there's a, 
a, a, you know, a, a politician with reasonably sound principles. Now, of course, we can go into book deals and this kind of thing. Once you dig into, as with all politicians, some things from their background, you will find other things lurk in there. But I came away from that going, well, I think I understood. You know, here's a guy who has some human principles. And many, many millions of people did. So this was at the same time while the Democratic Party themselves were trying to bury him. So what's the truth? Is that more important than a sentence or a vague hearsay comment that you think might have offended him or offended you? Sorry. He's an example of toxic masculinity. Well, personally, I don't really agree with that as a concept. Um, you may decide you do. That's up to you. But is he? Or is it just because he trains and he hunts? Um, surely be better to uh, hunt your own food and eat it, you know, than all that Monsanto bulked up cyber meat, Mr. Young. I don't know. Or simply, it's just old fashioned bias. As he came from the MMA, ipso facto, for some people, then he must be a meathead. I don't know. It's very hard to say. But when you push people, give me a specific. They kind of can't really. And if they give you one, you can give them one from the other side. Um, and now, of course, things are ramping up. Just a casual search and we'll show you now the smears have been ramped up to racism and indeed all sorts of isms and ists, misinformation causing death, blah, blah, blah. So they are doubling down on this and ramping up the rhetoric. You can imagine dozens of researchers right now going back over hundreds, if not thousands of episodes of The Rogan Show looking for any throwaway comment anything they can shine a light on and amplify. I even watched a CNN segment just before this writing where five talking heads seem to suggest that the First Amendment isn't applicable to Spotify or isn't applicable to Rogan, seeing as his audience is so huge. Well, once upon a, once upon a time, their audience was that huge and that somehow Spotify um, is exempt. But no doubt, of course, if they had the numbers, they wouldn't be claiming the First Amendment when in this circumstance it suited them. And now you might know, you might know of Substack. It's one of the places where um, journalists like Matt Taibbi, uh, one of the best journalists there is now, Glenn Greenwald, Barry Weiss, all these people who are, are writing super important things. They can go to make a living because for the most part, um, their stories don't get published anymore in mainstream media. They are, I suppose... Um, dissenting to the mainstream narrative voice substack i would recommend matt taibi going over and you pay as a subscriber it's it's like a subscription service so in a sense it's private it's a private audience to substack now they're coming for substack saying that substack is a haven for racists and a haven for this and that and the other and all these kind of people are beginning to turn on substack so it would seem that they want literally there to be no dissenting voices, no opposing voices. And these are many voices who are um, left, former left, liberal, um, libertarian, progressive voices who are clearly to me in the middle of the argument who they are seeking to silence. Um, and it is with increasing frequency we find the brokers of power playing fast and loose with the idea of free speech. And in the US, the First Amendment, where I read, I read, I read a poll among young people. Now, of course, we can't really believe polls in as much as they can ever be trusted. But in general, when you watch the Vox Pop of people being interviewed and you, what, you looked at some of the numbers, um, it seemed to suggest that for many young people, um, the right to feeling safe was greater than anyone's right to free speech, which is, if you ask me, truly terrifying. You can go back and find a podcast of mine, which is, um, it is not your right to be offended, but it is my duty to offend because I believe that causing offense to the institutions of power and pillars of um, structure and governance of society is important to keeping them in check, whether that be state or church or whatever else, allowing them free conglomeration of power um, for whatever moral crusade you're on means you are merely, I think, just a useful idiot, a foot soldier for an agenda that, of which you are not quite privy to. They call it the gilded cage, i.e. one that you create and make for yourself because you believe it to be um, open and free. But in actuality, it is a gilded, um, a gilded cage. It is something um, you, like I said, something one that you make for yourself and you feel it benefits you that you were made to feel righteous and moral in your aim of protecting people, called into action to defend altruism and empathy and go into war against hate by attacking free speech. It's a very clever trick, but the gilded cage it is nonetheless. And whether 
some people see it or not is of course open to discussion but I would look up the definition of the gilded cage um, the gilded cage in the gilded age someone can have that as a lyric somewhere go for it um, it's a clever trick there's no doubt about it asking us to build our own gallows if you want some um, black metal lyrical sensibility rolled into that and I say this not really as a Joe Rogan fanboy I mean, um, I don't watch every episode. Certainly, I found the last Jordan Peterson interview a bit tiresome, going over the same kind of ground, using cutesy animal metaphors. Um, by now, I find a bit done with some of them. But with the greatest of respect, I'm glad they both exist and get to speak on the platform. Um, I choose, I choose, chose not to listen to most of it or to not bother or to go out and do something else productive in your community or whatever it is you're doing. You can have that choice. But I would rather that the Joe Rogan experience is there rather than not being there. Because if it's not there and isn't allowing um, platforms to people who have no other access to speaking out, then what is there? And if he goes, then you may all quake in your boots because I think then nobody is particularly safe. He ain't perfect, but I'll call shenanigans, confirmation bias and old fashioned jealousy is the structure of most of the criticism. Um, or on a far bigger level, the simple fact that old oh, legacy media, state institutions and powers of governance, a multinationals, pharma, tech, they want complete control of this narrative. And at the moment, um, the Joe Rogan experience is the uh, is the runaway train that's out of control. And like I said, if you don't like Joe Rogan and you're rubbing your hands with glee at the prospect of all these people, you kind of dislike being cancelled. Consider the world after Rogan if they remove him. If he goes, then who is left? Let's be clear, as I said, no one is safe. And you think that's fine and well as you applaud from the sidelines. Let's be clear. And this is one of the things that I marvel at with people who applaud censorship and applaud deplatforming and applaud cancellations. They think that the final word and concept rests with them. It doesn't. It never did. And it never will. Eventually, the machine turns and comes for you. And... Just like Trotsky, you're going to get the ice pick as well. Um, that's in my head from listening to The Stranglers the other week. Um, and that's how it works. Um, so what you cheer on tomorrow, well, the knock on the door is eventually going to come. And you're going to be taken out from um, the safe confines of your home. And, you know, shown the true face of censorship, of all of those kind of things. Because like I said... And this is one of the greatest sort of misunderstandings of all of this is because people, as I said, see um, they see the personal as political, whatever you want to call it. And they think that the moral um, judgment rests with them. But the actuality is, of course, it doesn't. Of course, it's greater. It's bigger. It's broader. It's an umbrella decision. It's it involves, as I said, state tech, multinationals, tons of money. And the artists that you dislike, who you're vaguely you know, pleased with the fact that they've been silenced. Tomorrow it will be not only the artist that you like, but eventually you. So there we go. Blah, 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 blah. I'm Alan Averill. I'm just a singer in a heavy metal band trying to make sense of things I don't understand. A rambling stream of consciousness is episode 93. I will try and do some more grim musical um, Bathory-esque metal things for the next few episodes. But I thought it was worth having a discussion about that because, after all, the principle of agitators, agitators, blah, 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 agitators anonymous is free speech, sceptical, rational thinking. And so, on those terms... From, I, from, as I said, the freedom-loving capital of the West. That is Dublin in the Republic of Ireland. Um, I greet you all, Planet Satan, over and out.